I'm going to be introducing Father Sundborg, the president of Seattle University, for the past 16 years. I believe you're the runner-up to that record. And many of you know Father Sundborg. He is one of our esteemed club members, and he, I think he's one of our role models. He also serves as a board member or trustee on the United Way of King County, Independent Colleges of Washington, the YMCA of Greater Seattle, Lakeside School, the University of San Francisco, Georgetown University, Chair of the Association of Jesuit Colleges and Universities. Yes, he is one of our members, and simply put, we're really proud of him. His speech today is appropriate, transforming traumas into triumphs. Welcome, Father. It's a great privilege for me to be invited back again to speak as a fellow member with my colleagues of Rotary 4, and it's even a greater privilege to be able to do so on this day when we honor these students who are winners for life, who've overcome significant challenges in their lives, have been nominated by their school counselors, and are people in whom not only others believe, but in whom we too, as Rotarians, believe. So I dedicate my remarks today to you, the students, the Winners for Life, and I invite my colleagues from Rotary 4 to listen in. We not only believe in you, but we know that there's much that we, your elders, can learn from your exceptional experience. So as I speak, I hope that my fellow Rotarians, while eavesdropping, will be asking themselves also the questions about how the experience of these young people applies just as much to them as to these students. I take as my title this afternoon, Winners for Life, Transforming Traumas into Triumphs. And what got me to this subject was thinking of the challenges that these students have overcome and recalling a student at Seattle University that I once spoke to Rotary about. His name was Khaled. Here's the gist of what his story was. At the age of 12, he was working in a family bakery and an eggshell dropped into the batter of this large industrial mixer that was making pastry. And Khaled reached in to grab the eggshell and his arm got caught in the mixer and his arm got pulled into the mixer and he passed out and his arm was amputated. Now when he was a 19-year-old kid, he was listless, he was depressed, and one day, some nuns said, Khaled, why don't you come and just pay a visit to a little school we have for traumatized children? Khaled didn't know if he wanted to do that, but he went along, and when he entered the schoolroom, there was a little girl who had been traumatized by violence in her family who fled underneath the table when Khaled entered the room. And one-armed Khaled got down and crawled under the table and spoke to her and played with her, and after about 20 minutes, he was able to lead this little girl out from under the table into the light. And he realized in that moment that his own trauma of having lost that arm when he was 12 years old gave him a compassion and an ability to work with traumatized children. And he decided that he would dedicate his life to that purpose he came to Seattle University in order to perfect his ability to work in schools for traumatized children. And that trauma of his own life, the loss of his arm at the age of 12, was turned into a triumph, a special capacity that he otherwise would not have had, for he had only before then felt sorry for himself because of what had happened to him, a strength that he could use in helping others. Now, my belief is that something like this happens to all of us, for we are all wounded, and perhaps we are wounded early in life. And most certainly, you are winners for life. Our students are transforming 
your challenges, your struggles, your traumas into triumphs. It's like what I'm sure you've heard that the oyster can only spin a beautiful pearl within itself around a grain of sand. It needs to wrestle, as it were, with the grit or the grain of sand of life in order to fashion the pearl within it. So too, the trauma is like that grain of sand or that grit around which we can fashion something that is precious and that is beautiful, not only for ourselves, for others. Another image of that is the famous Greek orator named Demosthenes. He was the greatest orator of his day. And Demosthenes grew up with a speech impediment. He was not able to speak clearly. And therefore, to overcome this, he put pebbles in his mouth. In order to force himself to speak clearly and distinctly, through the added impediment of a mouthful of rocks. Now that's how he became the greatest orator in all of Greek history. He transformed the trauma of his impediment into the triumph of his speaking ability. And we Jesuits who perhaps studied too much Greek used to joke among ourselves, as Demosthenes once said, that's Jesuit humor, sort of a acquired taste, and I don't think you want to acquire it. <laughs> so you are honored students. You too are here, and your Rotarians are eavesdropping. Maybe you've had something in your life like Khaled or Demosthenes had, something that you had to overcome. So let me bring this home by telling you about four students of Seattle University who are in the process of transforming their tri traumas into triumphs. And perhaps to bring it more close to our own ordinary experience, I'll end by telling my own story of a traumatized youth. And I interviewed each of these students for the sake of this speech. Rebecca. Rebecca's Latina. And when she was eight years old, her father simply disappeared from her family abandoned the home and abandoned the mom and the three daughters. And for Rebecca, what this meant that she had a very hard time trusting anyone, for the dad whom she depended on inexplicably was no longer there, and there was no explanation why. Now, when she came to Seattle University, she started working with high school students, and then she found herself working with middle school students, and then with elementary school students, and then with Head Start or preschool students, and finally with one, two, and three-year-old children at Child Haven. These were children who had either been abused or had been neglected. And Rebecca focused in on the children who had been neglected. You see, she was climbing down the ladder to the own, her own source of her own trauma about trusting in her life. These children were unwashed. They often wore dirty clothes. She told me that sometimes their ears were so dirty they couldn't hear. Often, even by the age of two and a half or three, they were unable to speak. But above all, she said, they could not trust. In them, Rebecca came home to her own trauma. She taught these children, just by playing and being with them, how to trust, but not to trust blindly, which she said would be very dangerous for them but only to trust a genuinely caring adult and to know when an adult truly is trustworthy. So when I looked at Rebecca while interviewing her, though I had a hard time to listen to her as I stared at the ring through her eyebrow and her lip, <laughs> as I looked at her, I saw this happy, bubbly, fun-loving, humble young woman with a gift to help neglected children in order to help them to trust. She climbed down the ladder of her own childhood trauma to find a place to go back behind the earliest place where she had lost trust and stitch together an ability to help others. Rebecca was a winner for life. She transformed her trauma into a human trauma, into a human triumph. How about us? Andrew. The story of Andrew, another Seattle University student, is a curious one, not as dramatic as Rebecca's,
but just as instructive. Andrew's from San Francisco. On his mother's side, he's Irish. On his father's side, he's Iranian or Persian. I don't know from which of his parents he got the very dark eyes and the tight, dab, black, curly hair. One day when he was a boy, his Persian mother took him into downtown San Francisco, and they happened to encounter there some people who were living on the street, some homeless people. And Andrew had never seen anybody like this, so he wanted to run up and go up. He was curious. He wanted to talk to them. But his mother pulled him back and in Farsi said to Andrew, don't, they're dirty. And from that seemingly small incident, Andrew's journey began. He was attracted by, but he was afraid of the homeless. So when he came to Seattle University, he went to work in a soup kitchen with other students. And he told me the story that he would be in the kitchen. He'd be looking through the window of the kitchen into the dining room where the homeless came to eat. And he would see other students who were there, and they were hanging out with the homeless. And they were talking with them, and they were laughing, and they were sharing a meal. And he so wanted it, broke his heart. He wanted to go out there and to be with them. He just couldn't do it. So he stayed in the kitchen and he stared out and he so much wanted to be with the homeless, but he was afraid. They were the other and he couldn't cross the boundary to the other. Now he was helped by an experience of an immersion trip in Ecuador and then by a group of fellow students in a faith-based program called Justice Walking a program in which students teach one another to jaywalk. Now, J is with a capital J of either justice or Jesus. Take your pick at a Jesuit university. <laughs> and these students teach one another how to break the laws that are written into us by class and separation, how to jaywalk to people who are different from ourselves. So Andrew began to cross the boundary to the other. He volunteered for real, exchange, real change. He would give bundles of newspapers to the homeless. And he told me that one day he walked up from Elliott Bay up to the top of First Hill. And along the way, he recognized and called out by name six homeless people who were selling real change on the corners. He then made friends with teenagers who were homeless on Broadway, young adults, not to do anything for them, but just to be with them as they were and as he was. Andrew says that the homeless, what they want is not that we do something for them, but that we be for them the gift of presence. And quickly he adds, present with his dark eyes looking at me in my office, that Father Steve is what we all thirst for, the gift of presence. So Andrew transformed his seemingly small trauma into a wonderful, wide triumph, developing from childhood challenge a capacity for human presence with the other, even with the university president. It really wasn't about the fear of the homeless, was it? It was fear of the person who is different from us. So how about us? What's our story? Rebecca and Andrew are two threads in a tapestry of a story common to all of us, the fashioning of something precious around the gift, the grit of childhood, speaking clearly through the pebbles of our problems. What's the thread of your story? Tommy. We have a program at Seattle University called Fostering Scholars. It's for young people who age out of foster care at the age of 18 and who have demonstrated their ability to succeed in college. This program provides for these students a college education, a 365-day-a-year home, health insurance, an ordinary college social life with classmates, and a very tough love mentor. We have 22 fostering scholars right now, and 18 have already graduated. They beat the odds that only 2% of young people who age out of foster care in the United States ever get a college degree. Tommy was one of them. He's now graduated and he runs IT technology for an important institution. Now, Tommy, a happy, carefree guy, was the second of seven children, but his mother was not able to care for them. 
For a period of time, she'd have the seven children, then she could not pay for food or for heat in cold Minnesota where they lived. And so the children would be taken away by the state. He remembers the younger children screaming when the police took them away. Tommy instead would think, what can I make of this? He lived in as many as six states, in a dozen foster care homes, in and out, back in and out, one school then another, one family another, some families who took advantage of the foster care system for financial purposes, one state and then another. Finally, the family was removed permanently from the mom, and he's only able to be in contact with two of his family. The other four were adopted out, and he doesn't know where they are. At age 16, he came to Seattle. He was greatly helped by Treehouse, a program for foster kids. He went to Rainier Beach High School, then to Seattle Central Community College, and with the help of a very generous family to Seattle University as a fostering scholar. Now what Tommy transformed his life's trauma into was an amazing capacity to break down any goal into achievable smaller goals. You see, he had to move so often as a child from one thing to another when he was young, he could never count on anything that would be constant, and he could not have any long-term goals. So he made this into an asset by focusing on, what can I do now? How can I learn in this one classroom? What can I do today? So he knows how to make overwhelming goals into very small solutions. That's why he's happy and carefree and why his pals say Tommy thrives in chaotic situations. He's cautious about people helping him out till he knows that they're genuine. He's wary of others putting too many hopes on him because these hopes of theirs, he says, can often become pressures. He makes goals into games and he awards himself with fun with his friends when he wins a game. So there he was in my office, and when I talked with him, seated in a leather chair opposite me in my paneled office, he broke down my big presidential questions into smaller manageable ones, and I'm sure he treated himself to a win with Father Steve. <laughs> so I wonder if you, some of our winners for life, our students, have you had anything like Tommy's experience of come-and-go foster care or maybe some unreliable early childhood background. And I wonder if this transforming of his chaos into a triumph mirrors what you've already begun to do in your lives. And I wonder, too, if this experience of breaking down all big goals into achievable small goals speaks to the businessmen and the businesswomen of Rotary so that we, too, can learn from the Tommies of the world. Yasmin. The last Seattle University student I'd like you to meet has had the most brutal trauma of any of them. I learned of Yasmin, a second-year law student, from a front-page Seattle Times story about her as a victim of human trafficking. So I asked her if she would come and speak with me. She's beautiful, and she's quick to point out that she's not nearly as serious as the photo on the front page of the Times made her out to be. And she's also quick to say, that it's better to call the kind of explo exploitation she suffered modern-day slavery rather than human trafficking, especially because it does not need to be international. It's right here in our home territory, and it's simply the total control or exploitation by others. Yasmin and her family were kept captive by her father on a remote farm in Grays Harbor County with no contact whatsoever with the outside world. A father who was controlling, who was dominating, who abused the family physically, sexually, and psychologically, though for some reason, and she doesn't know why, he did not sexually abuse her. Her mother, whom her father brought, or you might say bought, from Bangladesh at the age of 12, and who could neither read nor write nor could speak English, was only 14 when Yasmin was born. Her father falsified all documents, hid away any kind of identification, and would only take two of the family off the farm at any one time under his strict 
supervision. He did horrible things, beating her uncle nearly to death in the presence of the rest of the family and requiring and forcing him to dig his own grave. Finally, he was arrested and imprisoned when Yasmin was four years old. But she has vivid memories of almost unmentionable things that go back much earlier than that. She's shaped by those memories. But even more, she's shaped by realizing, this is my father, and I have to come to terms with that. And there are even some things I admire in this otherwise exploitative dad. From this background, she's developed a passionate drive to understand complex, conflicted persons. No wonder she is a law student. So she's transformed her trauma into a triumph by seeking to understand everything in three-dimensional, multifaceted ways. She says that nothing is simple, especially people. Nothing can be taken at face value. Because her life was so traumatic early on, she just tried, she had to try to understand things around her from all sides, or she chose to do that. She sees oppressors and oppressed as both having their traumas. She realizes that she either had to forget her childhood or she had to understand it. She strove to understand it, developed a passion for books, perhaps both because her father was a scholar and her mother could not read, while others in her family chose to forget and rather than choosing books, chose drugs. Out of this understanding that people are multidimensional, Yasmin wants to give her life to create spaces for people to dialogue, to get beyond the images they create and they put upon one another, and to find out why people are the way they are. She wants to confront all forms of human exploitation, of which human trafficking or modern-day slavery is but one kind, and to see people not just as victim and offender, but how they got into that, and more, is there more than that to them? So she has a very big agenda from the huge trauma that she suffered as a small child. So if Yasmin can transfer, transform her trauma into that kind of triumph, what of whatever we experience can't we transform into our own triumph in life, both for our own living and for the lives of others? my own story. Sometimes when you give an example from the lives of others, they seem so large dimensional or so different from your own that they don't come home and you seem you have fairly ordinary kinds of things from your life that are non-dramatic. So I've got nothing like Khaled or Rebecca or Andrew or Tommy or Yasmin in my background, but I've got something like a trauma, and I'll bet you do too. It's not worth writing home about but it's what my life was given to me to be, and so it's mine. And I have transformed it into a small triumph, and you are witnessing it right now. Let me give you my own example, and perhaps this will help our students as well as our Rotarians to consider their own ordinary traumas in their lives and what they've made of them. When I was young, a boy in Juneau, Alaska, and even a teenager in Washington, D.C., I was almost pathologically shy and sensitive. I could not stand when my parents were away just for a weekend. I would cry. My four brothers and sisters could bring me to tears at will, though thankfully and lovingly, they hardly ever did. I was so shy that at Boy Scout camp, where I was dreadfully homesick every single year but did not have the gumption to say I do not want to go. I did not have the assertiveness while sitting with Troop 23 in mess hall to reach out and to take French toast from a platter, for I was waiting for it to be passed around. But I waited, and it was never passed around. So I nearly starved until parents' weekend when mom and dad came and rescued me with chicken and potato salad and chocolate chip cookies, which I'd hide under my bunk in our tent until the rats and the squirrels appropriated them. 
And I needed a younger sister to invite her girlfriends as my dates for those darn mandatory school dances at my high school. And I still remember painfully going totally blank, barely into the recitation of an elocution piece in front of an entire high school audience and needing to be called off the stage by the nun after what seemed to be hours of silent public humiliation. So my childhood trauma, my challenge, is nothing to write home about, is it? But what I believe I've transformed this minor trauma into is an ability to go within myself in reflection, a depth of presence to myself, a drawing from a deep well within, a learning to speak from who I really am and what I treasure most in life, and the development of a daily life of prayer and of poetry. That's my way of transforming a trauma into a triumph. And I remember once saying in a 10-week college course on world religions that I was teaching, just an offhand remark that I made that came from the American psychotherapist Rollo May, quote, shyness is the most personal of all human emotions. It is simply the shadow side of the perception of the preciousness and vulnerability of relationships. And on the last day of that course, after 10 full weeks, one college student, a man about 20 years old, came up to me and awkwardly, because he too was shy, said that that one sentence was worth more to him than the whole rest of the course. Someone had told him that being shy is not only okay, but can be a feeling of sensitivity and of treasuring something precious. You see, shy people don't give themselves away easily in relationships. They've got too much to give, and they realize the risk of the giving. That's my little story, my triumph. So I wonder if we all, thank you. So I wonder if we all have some capital T or small t triumph in our past around which and from which we have spun a pearl of great price. Of course, we can be trapped in our traumas, locked up in them, unable to shatter them or break through. Khaled teaches little children to release their traumas by dance, music, shouting, screaming, punching. But it's always more than that. It takes the help of other people. Khaled needed the compassionate nuns. Rebecca needed social workers at Child Haven. Andrew depended on fellow students to help him to jaywalk. Tommy needed a final stable family and a safe college, which he could call home and where he could have friends. Yasmin required rescue by police and great teachers and mentors. And I needed the companionship of Jesuits and the pebbles in my mouth of being asked by others to give plenty of speeches. Some of you, our honored students, may have needed the gift of the presence of Rotarians at the Rotary Boys and Girls Club or the mentorship of so many Seattle U students who are athletes who love being among you there. So when you look at the triumph, which is won from a trauma, it is always the unique shape and the flow and the wonder of your own personal life. The person you were created to be, but now released and coming forward. We honor you, our students, today as winners for life. May that life be nothing less and need be nothing more than your own true life. And may we, your Rotarian friends and mentors, be privileged to be some of the people by whom you are helped to transform your traumas into triumphs so that you may not only this day, but always be winners for life. Thank you. Seattle Rotary Online is made possible in part by a grant from First Choice Health, working with the Washington Health Information Collaborative to use technology to bring better health care to patients throughout the Pacific Northwest. First Choice Health. 